great to be with you, Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. When we're visiting about this webinar, you know, we have record high cattle prices and uh, uh, record high volatility as well. So we thought it would be good to discuss some of that. And so I'm going to give uh, a quick update on cattle price outlook for feeder cattle and also do a little bit on price risk management. I've been doing quite a few educational sessions already and sometimes spend 40 to 50 minutes on each one of those. And we have a lot of less time today. So I'm going to go through this uh, relatively quickly and just hit the high points. And so without further ado, let's just move along. The three most important factors that affect feeder cattle prices are supply of feeder cattle, corn and feed prices, and then fed cattle prices. So let's begin on the supply side. Uh, you see the uh, here where uh, the USDA does an inventory report twice a year, January and July. So here's our July feeder cattle supplies outside of feedlots. And you will notice uh, looking up uh, from the, the bottom key there and, and for 2023, our feeder cattle supplies are currently the same as they were back in 2014 at the lowest levels on the chart. And uh, back in 2014, we had record high prices. So no surprise that in 2023, we're back to record high prices again, very much supported by this low supply. This will be the fifth straight year of declining cow numbers. So we've got four lower calf crops and next year the calf crop will be even lower. So that certainly supports prices. Next, then we go to feed prices and corn prices. I like to use Omaha corn prices because that's where the feedlots are that purchase our feeder cattle. And there's the old adage on the top there. We change corn 10 cents a bushel, change calf prices a buck in the opposite direction. And so last year at this time, we were talking $7 corn. We started out this year with the red line there at $7. And by the way, my charts are all color coded the same way this year. Uh, 2023 will be red and last year 2022 will be blue and the purple will either be a five-year average or it will be 2021 previous years and get to that when we talk about cattle. So uh, not good for those selling corn but good for cattle with that uh, uh, rule of thumb we use on the top started out at seven dollars last week the average price at Omaha was 465 and so uh you know, uh, that uh, $2.35 decline in prices has, been, of corn prices, has really been positive for feeder cattle prices. And another thing while we're talking about corn is in the upper right-hand corn corner, you see an ethanol plant in North Dakota today was paying three eighty five for corn. And so that's 80 cents less than Omaha. And uh, so we do background a lot of cattle in North Dakota. And one of the reasons we do that is because feed is cheaper, corn is cheaper. And then we have a lot of alternative feeds that work very well in a backgrounding ration. In Omaha, of course, they want to buy at the feedlots. They want to buy eight, eight fifty steers and heifers rather than the lighter ones and let us do it cheaper up here. And then they buy the weight and then they pour the coals to them with their more expensive corn. So, uh, you know, the feed situation up here certainly favors backgrounding and the declining corn prices have really uh, added to and supported feeder cattle prices. The other thing then that affects feeder cattle prices are fed cattle prices, particularly in those distant futures when those feeder cattle that the, the feedlots purchase will finish out. So because of shorter supplies and good demand for beef as well, uh, fed cattle prices are, the red as the red line you see there, are at record high levels. Um, you know, for, on a cyclical basis, the last cyclical low was in 2020, a terrible year with COVID and $95 fed cattle. And we've been increasing since then. And so uh, this year, in mid-year there, we were $40 higher than last year up there at 184 and we're still $20 higher than last year. So that price is certainly also supporting feeder cattle prices. The gold square there are the futures uh, for next year that are now showing 
uh, maybe a little bit lower than they are this year, but the uh, live cattle futures have fallen off quite a bit here in the last couple of months. And we can do better than that on fed cattle next year if the stars all align. Back, at, at you'll see there in the upper part of the chart, on September 15th, um, live cattle, the April uh, 2024 live cattle futures were up there at 193. And now they're down there at, uh, I've closed at 174.87, about 175 days. So they have been higher. Uh, USDA's last estimate for fed cattle for next year is 184.50, which would be higher than the futures are now. But uh, that's uh, just where they're at now. But these uh, higher prices are certainly supportive to feeder cattle prices, as we'll see now. So here's the 550 to six weight calves. Kind of the same story there. We've continually increased cyclically the, the last several years. And then this year, with the lower corn prices and the record high fed cattle prices, uh, we have moved up to record high levels for feeder cattle as well. And, uh, you know, 70 some dollars higher than they were last year. So what that means from a backgrounding standpoint is we're going to put the most expensive calves that we ever have into the feedlot for backgrounding. And so when we get to talking a little bit about price risk management, just probably another reason to do that. Again, there is, you know, seasonally, we do back off after the, the summer highs and go down as the bigger supplies hit the market, but they're still supported up there at record high levels. And, you know, some things that can affect that towards the end of the year, sometimes we see a bump in prices. Sometimes we get that from, Winter wheat uh, demand down south, uh, not as good this year, although it has started raining down in Oklahoma and Texas now, and the wheat is greening up, but they're going to use some of that to keep their cow herd because there's interest in in rebuilding where they can do that. And the corn belt buyers, once they get the corn in the bin after combining, then they tend to come into the market, and we're just wrapping up harvest now, and again, uh, the longer we go, the, the longer the chance for the calves to be weaned, and that would end some, might, might add some support. So, so you know, there's a chance there that we're kind of at seasonal lows now and that, but just keep that uh, current price in mind. And, when, and later when uh, Dr. Parman talks about budgeting, uh, you know, that's one of the big costs is, or if they're your own cattle, again, they're going to be, have a record high value there, but Cattle feed calf prices are well supported by lower corn and the higher fed cattle prices. Go to the heavier weight yearlings, and these would be the calves uh, that would come out of our backgrounding program. Again, the same story as we've ratcheted prices up. There is a feeder of cattle futures for 800 pound steers. And again, they're in the, the gold bars there. The red line is what they've done this year. Uh, you know, you see that seasonal peak in September that usually occurs. It's occurred the last uh, three years and again this year and more and not in a minute. And uh, again, the same thing on the futures market there, the futures uh, for this uh, in January and then March, April and May, depending on when your backgrounded cattle come out, uh, you know, around 230 is would be a planning price uh, to use now. They work again quite a bit higher than that and, and more on that in a minute and they could, but you know, there's uh, there's risk that we're going to talk about. But in general, then the prices are really being supported by higher fed cattle and the lower uh, corn prices. So uh, here's the market report actually from the week before last week. Last week, uh, USD only reported one market, a low volume because of the Thanksgiving holiday. So this had uh, there's three markets reported by USDA. In North Dakota, that's uh, Napoleon and uh, Kiss and Mandan and Stockman's and Dickinson. And so this is a summary of that market. And again, I could talk about this probably for about 20 minutes, but just want to hit some highlights here as well. On my charts, I just use the average. So in the middle of the chart there, you see for 550 to six weight steer calves, these would be the ones that would be priced into a backgrounding program. Uh, 272 was that average that I showed you on my chart. But you see the wide range there. Cat, the same weight and grade of calves at the same market sold from 248 to 
8650 that's a 3850 dollar range as it shows there so if you're going to buy the 28650s or if that's the value of your calves certainly they need to be uh you know uh, into a high value program coming out as as backgrounded steers uh, so you might consider if you're buying them, maybe buying more of the average or to the lower end and adding value to them and uh, would be, you know, a, a good thing to do in a backgrounding program. The other thing is uh, that heifer calves are always this time of the year discounted quite a bit from steer calves. You see their, uh, you know, their counterpart 550 to six weight heifers are there at 243. Uh, almost a $30 uh, difference when they're that uh, at, at the lower weight, every 50 pounds heifers gain, they gain price. And so we get down there to those 850 to nine weight uh, heifers uh, and steers are the same price. Uh, actually the heifers a little above, but they're a little lighter. The 866 heifers at 207 uh, over a week ago in the eight. 89 steers at 204. So uh, we always do background a lot of heifers. Uh, usually uh, uh, budgeting shows that we make good money on heifers. And again, that's a, a later talk that we'll talk about. So just some other things. I'm sure we're going to background. I'll keep a lot of heifers. And then uh, another thing about heifers, you see that there's already on the right hand side there, there's already replacement heifers bringing premium prices in this spring. That's going to be the case again, I think. Again, like I said, there is interest in, in herd rebuilding where moisture is better. Uh, West River, North Dakota had good weather this uh, year and probably interest in some keeping some heifers and herd rebuilding there. And even now it's raining down in Texas and Oklahoma. And, uh, you know, California is in better shape. So uh, replacement heifers are going to be at a premium. And so backgrounding them and and uh, and making replacements out of them is something well and then you know it gives you flexibility and uh, if it turns dry in the spring uh, uh, again we they we, you know we can sell them as, as feedlot heifers and we've added value the other thing i just want to quickly mention over on the steer side is yeah we certainly encourage backgrounding and backgrounding is putting weight on cattle but just be careful so you don't get them too fleshy because you see down there, those 712 pound fleshy steers are $10 off uh, their counterpart average. And so uh, just be careful that you don't uh, put too much groceries in them and push them too hard so that you uh, take a, a discount on them. So uh, just move along then. We've had a extreme volatility in the market. And so, uh, you know, I've always been getting a lot of questions. Why did both the futures and the cash prices decline after September 15th? And it's all for very good reasons. So we'll start first with the futures market on the two charts on the left-hand side. And then we'll have already kind of uh, introduced you to the cash market side. But let's just go there. There, The November feeder cattle futures closed on, on they usually closed the last Thursday of the month, but because that was Thanksgiving, they actually closed on the 16th. But anyway, go back to September 15th. You see the, uh, you know, everything was very optimistic and, and the speculators and the funds had, had really got into cattle, you know, other, the grains were somewhat suffering. You saw corn going down and some of the others and so the cattle was a hot item to get into. So they ran uh, the, the uh, November futures up there to $268. But the green line is the cash is the CME cash settlement price. And that's an important price for two reasons. One, that's when the November feeder or any, any uh, contract closes, all open contracts are closed by that cash price which is a, uh, I'll show you what it is in a minute when I talk about LRP, but it's just a, a national average price computed by all the USDA market reporters. And then they, then uh, the CME comes up with one price. So you see the cash price was down there at 253, but the futures were up at 268, but they got to be, you know, when we got to the uh, so to the September futures closing and then the October and then the November. And now we'll look at January in a minute. They got to be the same. And you see, I left this November chart on there, even though it's closed, because they were the same. The, both the futures and the cash settlement price 
were right, right at 229 uh, at the end, just like they always are, but they had to come together. So back to September 15th, the future started going down so it could get down to the cash price. And, you know, that'd be a very normal situation. Uh, start, uh, sell, uh, people that were along the market started selling because they knew that they were going to be together. So they did get down. Then there was talk then in the middle of October that a cattle on feed report come out, showed that we had uh, a few more cattle on feed than last year. And uh, and uh, again, uh, you know, the market kind of crashed there for a couple of days because, the, again, the Chicago traders said, oh, my gosh, USDA missed it. We've got more cattle around than they thought and, you know, whatever. And that wasn't the case at all. You go down to the chart on the bottom, shows you what happened because it was so dry in the south. And, you know, 50 percent of our cow herd was in drought this summer and it got it's gotten better by now. But we had a record, of, we have, still have, a record amount of heifers on feed simply because they couldn't uh, keep them and, and some were intended as replacements, and but they had to go on feed. So all those heifers on feed, we didn't have any more cattle than we had before the report came out. It's just that we put a lot of heifers into the feedlot instead of a re, uh, uh, making replacements out of them because we were out of forage. So again, then, the cash market went down and 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 the and the, the, the futures did come back up to the cash market and that's uh, how they ended up on the cash market side then i mentioned this before but september is always a seasonal high for for these heavier weight yearlings and then they go down in fact continually go down into march when a lot of them are sold and and that's happened the last 3 years go to the blue line last year they were up there 190 and, you know, dropped to 170 in previous years. If you go down to the bottom chart, that is the 10-year seasonal price index for these uh, 750 to 8 weight steers. And all an index is, this is a 10-year index, so you just add up all the average prices for September divided by 10 and for all the other months and see which ones average the highest. And so you see... September average is 5% higher than they are now. And then by the time you get into March lower, so that's a normal seasonal thing. So when we get to price risk management, kind of remember that, that September, when you, for the cattle that you're backgrounding into the spring, be it January, February, March, whatever, uh, September is a really good time to look at, at price risk management. But that wasn't unusual. That that Again, that decline in the cash market can be expected to happen and it happened like other years. Here's the January feeder cattle futures. And again, kind of the same thing there you see back in September. And lately, again, we've just had extreme volatility. The last three days we had, you know, all not quite limit down, but five, six dollar declines just because the the decline in the futures market is is triggering people to get out of the, the market. And so, but the cash market hung in there. And so all of a sudden the futures got way below the uh, the uh, cash market and, you know, down there to, uh, you know, under 215. And so today then, as should have happened, the futures went up the limit, the 825 limit, because it's got to catch up to the cash market it was up there at 2.30, and the, although we'll see, you know, th this is always a day behind, but yesterday's cash market did drop off some, but still the futures are below the cash market, so that supports the futures market in, uh, in going up. More on that limit movement in a minute because that does affect livestock risk protection. So uh, here's the cattle price cycle. Again, we are on the upward side and, you know, we're going to have fewer calves next year and it all depends on corn and those other factors, but it looks like prices are going up. So you look at this and you say, well, Tim says prices are going to be higher, so we don't need price risk management, but that is not a, it at all. Uh, I still encourage price risk management, particularly on a seasonal basis like backgrounding or summer grazing, that even though the cyclical trend, this is year to year now, is going to be higher. There's certainly risk 
for all the different things that can affect the market. You know, what's corn going to do? Is it going to dry? We have all these geopolitical issues and war in the Middle East and high inflation and high credit card debt with consumers and on and on and on. So there's always risk. So, uh, you know, from a cattle price standpoint, we're in the increasing phase. But we're, when we're at record high prices, volatility is also record, as we've seen. So if you don't think price risk management is important, just look at the past since September 15th uh, of how the market went down and, and, and another reason for price risk management. So if you didn't believe it before, you know, I think that that is a good lesson for us. And I still think that we, sh we should consider it because there's always a risk for lower prices. So the best marketing strategy when uh, we're in the upward phase of the price cycle, like we are now, is to lock in a floor price, but leave the top side open because, you know, prices were higher a while ago and, you know, they're, they, they could go up. And so if that happens, if corn keeps going down, would be supportive to prices and so on. So we want to lock in a floor price and leave the top side open. So there are two ways to do that. One is livestock risk protection insurance. The other is futures market options. If you're used to using one or the other and they work for you, that's fine. Uh, I'm just going to mention a little bit. I, again, I could spend 50 minutes talking about LRP and explaining it more, but I don't have the time. But I'm just going to hit some high points because uh, LRP is a good way to lock in a floor price and then leave the top side open. And it gives us uh, some more flexibility than the futures. Again, the feeder cattle futures is a 50,000 pound contract for 800 pound steers, where uh, LRP is for, uh, uh, you have an under 600 pound contract for, and for beef steers uh, and heifers. So you have two contracts there. And then a six to a thousand pound beef steer or heifer, both uh, contracts. The thousand pounds is in red there because uh, that was a recent change. It used to be six to, to uh, uh, 899, 900 pounds, but now they raised it to a thousand pounds. So we picked the weight and uh, the insurance period then is uh, 13 weeks in advance all the way. And again, I have policies may be available for the following weekly links and, uh, and, uh, Yesterday, the LRP did offer 13, 17, 21, and the 13 week contract, if it would have came out today, would have matured on February 27th. So, uh, you know, if your cattle are coming out in January, it's a little bit too late for LRP. But, to, but when the market moves the limit in a contract month, then LRP is not offered for that month and the next month. So today's offering were the 13 and 17 week, that would be for February or March, were not offered because of that January feeder cattle moved the limit. Tomorrow, if the market doesn't move the limit, then uh, you know they will those will be offered again. So what's offered right now after 4:30 today until 8:30 tomorrow morning. The closest one we can get is April. So if you're back on the cattle into April, you could still buy one today, but not for the uh, February or the March. And uh, today they just offered through the 39 week, which is all the way out into August. After that is a kind of a little further out, but they'll they'll add those later. And the real beauty of LRP is you, you know you can do one head if you want to 120 you know do a few at a time it's a good way to learn without spending a lot of money and so on so so whatever number you have if you want to do half of them or whatever you have that flexibility possibly unlike the futures so the lrp is based on that cash settlement price that we saw before and uh, it comes out every day on the cme website showing there the current index is at 226.96. So yesterday, uh, all of uh, 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 the over 600 pound uh, uh, contracts, LRP contracts would have been closed at that price. And, uh, and so here's what the spreadsheet looks like every day. Then the, the uh, market reporters send their information to the uh, CME and they just uh, do a weighted average. And I took this from the 16th for a couple of reasons. One, it's 
the, the last Thursday when when uh, both Dickinson and Napoleon re were reported. And then it was the last day for the November feeder cattle. So you see at the bottom there, the uh, cash settlement price was 228.64, and the futures were that that day. So uh, they were the same, but it's all transparent. And what it is, you know, there's a daily average computed that 226.98 over there at the bottom, but the actual cash settlement price is a seven day moving average. And so that's that actual cash settlement price. And that's what you're betting on when you purchase an LRP contract. It isn't the actual price that you get for your cattle. The price that you, you might look at that, that current 226 and say, well, that's a really good price for 900 pound steers. I'll take that. But it's on the other hand, you say that's a terrible price for 650 steers. So I'm not going to do LRP. But that isn't how LRP works. LRP, you're betting against that cash settlement price, uh, and, and that usually moves down about this or up about the same much, um, amount as those other market classes. So you can use it, but this is this is what you get paid on. So here's what the uh, offering today looked like then. Uh, and again, the closest one we could have got was this 21-week contract that matures uh, April 23rd. So uh, the April futures closed today at 227.42, as you see in the bottom. And USDA, if you go up there in the middle, you see expected ending value. USDA expected the, the value on April 23rd to be 227.42. Uh, 40 and a half cents was the right what the futures were. And that's what they look at is the futures market. Then they offered a coverage price of 223.98 was the highest one. And over there, uh, the other circle in green then was what you would pay per hundred weight. And just kind of an aside, kind of introducing the next speaker, just keep in mind that you don't have to buy that highest coverage price. We don't buy insurance, hoping we're going to collect anyway. We use this as a floor price, hope the market goes up and we don't collect. But for instance, on, uh, on our uh, uh, livestock economics website. There's a, a budget in there that you can use for computing your own. And and our, our next speaker is going to talk about budgets, but that it shows actually a 210 break even. So we could go down under those coverage prices and go down, for instance, that second one from the bottom, we could do a 213.98, still lock in a floor price above our break even and lower our pr premium from 696 to five or to 385. But it's all between you and your lender. What's your risk exposure, uh, how much you want and so on. And also then it's very important to know what your break even price is. So how you know what your break even price is, is by, uh, you know, doing a budget and figuring your cost and returns and so on. Uh, so with that, you know, I assure you that the market is going to continue to be very volatile. And there is risk with all the geopolitical and what's going to happen to corn and so on. Mm -hmm.